So the choir is going to sing this morning, Love Divine, Oh Love Excel. says, uh, finish then thy new creation. Is he finishing his creation in you? And uh, from glory to glory, he's changing us. And it's all because we are centered in his love. All right, so it's children's time, and Patty's going to come and share the resurrection eggs this morning. So kids, come on up.
aren't liable to. Oh, yeah. All of us. Three on each side. Six, yes, six. <coughs> so last week we had a lesson and we're using these neat eggs as our lesson. And so this is the second one. So this is where I need some help. There's not enough hands here. How is this? Can you try it? Okay. Here's the leg. All right, so I want someone to take the light purple egg. Yep, that one. And then the light pink one. inside of that in a minute. And what does it sound like? Sounds like peas. Peas? It does kind of sound like peas. It's coin. Boy, can you see through that? <laughs> oh. All right. So I'm going to tell a story. And we're going to, we're going to hear from this guy later. He's going to show up. Um, so it says, not everyone was happy to have Jesus as his king. Some people only pretended to be happy. But on the inside, they really didn't want one of those pretenders was a man named Judas Iscariot. And Judas is going to show up here, like I said, in a little while. Some other men hated Jesus so much that they wanted to kill him. But they needed the help of someone who would get them close to Jesus. Because Judas Iscariot was a pretender, and because he was greedy for money, he told these men that he would help them capture Jesus if they would pay him 30 silver So now we've got the coins, and what do coins have to do with the Easter story? Uh -huh. To raise Jesus, he raised the purple coin. That's right. That's right. He was kind of greedy, wasn't he? And each coin stands for credit. Ten coins for credit. That's right. Ooh, this is a math lesson. Ten dollars, <laughs> thirty coins, okay. All right, so we're going to talk about the second story this morning, that's the light purple one. Yes, that's it. You got that. You got that. So those are two stories that go along with our witness. 
season and there's fifth Sundays in it, and now we're going to have four after this Sunday. So let's say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these children. It is so wonderful to see them here this morning and to be with us and be able to share our stories with you with them. Keep them safe through the week. Help us to watch over them and be good examples for them. Thank you for the wonderful lessons that you give us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thanks for your help. children's time after the presentations. All right, so this is Jerusalem Speaks, Act 2, and we'll see what we find out about the 30 points. 30 points. I am Judas, the disciple of Jesus who betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. This was the amount I was paid by the high priest and the religious leaders who wanted Jesus dead. Darkness entered my heart. Satan himself had led me to betray the Son of God. It happened. Everything I did, just like the prophet Zechariah had foretold hundreds of years earlier, Zechariah's words were recorded there in the sacred scriptures for all to see. Words about me and what I would do. Zechariah prophesied that God's son would be betrayed, betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And so he was. This was the amount I received the price of a slave. For this price, it was I who sold God out to be arrested, condemned, and killed. It was also Zechariah who prophesied that the money would be thrown back. And so it was. After I saw Jesus condemned, I was filled with remorse and ran back to those who paid me. I returned the coins, confessing, I have sinned. I've betrayed innocent blood. 
The priests didn't care. Jesus would soon be dead, and that's exactly the way that they wanted it. Nothing would stop them now from eliminating Jesus, not even my confession. My words fell on deaf ears. No one would listen. I threw the money at them, and they used it to buy a field, a plot of land in which to bury foreigners who died while traveling through Jerusalem. The field was bought from a potter, and so it is called the potter's field. It's still in Jerusalem today. It's also called the field of blood because it was bought with blood money. Money used to shed the blood of Christ. Zechariah had prophesied that 30 pieces of silver would be thrown down in the house of the Lord and given to the potter. Can you imagine? Everything I had done had been recorded centuries before I even existed. The psalmist foretold that the Son of God's betrayal would come from a trusted friend. And so it did. From me. The scripture said, Even my close friend whom I have trusted, he who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I am overcome by what I have done to an innocent man, but mostly I am overcome by what Jesus said to me after I kissed him. The kiss of betrayal to mark him out to the guards. Jesus looked at me and said, friend, friend is the word he spoke to me. The one who knew I had come to betray him called me friend. I am overcome by what I have done to the innocent Son of God, whose life will soon end at the hands of others, and mine will now end at my own. about him, but how terrible it is 
for that person who betrays the human one. It would be, it would have been better for him if he had never been born. Now Judas, who would betray him, replied, It's not, it's not me, is it, Rabbi? Jesus answered, You have said it. And then after the supper, and after uh, going out into the Mount of Olives, and then into the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, we have these words from Matthew 26 as well. While Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came. With him was a large crowd carrying swords and clubs. They had been sent by the chief priests and elders of the people. His betrayer had given them a sign. Arrest, arrest the man I kiss. Just then, he came to Jesus and said, Hello, Rabbi. Then he kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came and grabbed Jesus and arrested him. And continuing on, after Jesus being tried or before the council, uh, as he's then before Pilate, these words in Matthew 27, when Judas, who betrayed Jesus, saw that Jesus was condemned to die, he felt deep regret. He returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders and said, I did wrong because I betrayed an innocent. But they said, what is that to us? That's your problem. Judas threw the silver pieces into the temple and left. Then he went and hanged himself. Let us pray. Father God, as we contemplate these scriptures this morning, as we consider the, the chief priests, specifically Caiaphas, and also one of your followers, Judas. Lord, speak to us how you would desire in the midst of these events that transpired, so that we might know how we can be one of your faithful disciples. And Lord, we just thank you for this time of opening our hearts and for reflection and for you speaking to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, one thing I want to start with this morning is that um, have you ever had a common occurrence with other another person or other people and you had a different reaction than they possibly did. You experienced the same thing, but it hits you differently than it hits somebody else. I know Samantha and I, when we go to see a movie, and we've watched a number of movies that Samantha has read the book, and then we go and watch the movie, and afterwards, I like to compare notes. Samantha's usually uh, on to the next thing. But I'll say, oh, wasn't that a great movie? And she says, well, it was all right, but it wasn't as good as the book. You know, so we all have different experiences. We all have different uh, events and things and personality that has happened to us before we get to the event that we share in common, like watching a movie, right? And so it might hit us differently or come across to us differently, even to the point of, was it a good movie or a, it was an all right movie, right? Well, in uh, 2008, I had the opportunity at 30, no, 41 years of age, to find, 
I've been a Cubs fan since I was about seven or eight years old when we lived uh, near Chicago. And, uh, but, and I've been to a White Sox game at the old Comiskey Park with my dad and my brother, but I never had gotten to go to Wrigley Field. Well, in 2008, I got to go and take my wife and my six sons, eight tickets, it was not cheap, even though we weren't in the uh, most expensive seats. Uh, to actually go see a Cubs game. And uh, it, was, it was wonderful being there after watching so many games on television of the Cubs playing at Wrigley Field and just taking it all in. Well, I think because of, and maybe this wasn't the reason, but the fact that my six boys got to take in the game, that then it became a tradition for my sons to take me to a baseball game around Father's Day. And fortunately, the, uh, the Cubs are now in the Cincinnati Reds division, and so they get to play each other a number of times a year. So we usually are able to, sometime during June, go to see, except for last year, of course, uh, to go see the Cubs and the Reds play. Now, you, I've got six boys and myself, and we've all been able to go, just like we did when we went to Wrigley Field in 2008. And um, for each of my six sons, I would say each of them, it's a little bit different, their experience of the game. For one thing, we're kind of almost split down the center of who's got red on and who's got blue on. And uh, so which team you're rooting for, and then, you know, if I had to characterize each of my sons, their interest in baseball probably, for most of them, has not matched their dads. And uh, so then when they're at the game, and you know a baseball game, there's a lot of other things to do to kind of keep your interest since it's a kind of a slow-moving game, right? Uh, in football, you don't want to miss any play. But in baseball, you can miss a ton of plays and you can still know the score is the same, right? And uh, so uh, I'd say one of my sons, Travis, which he roots for the Cubs, and he is interested. We can, we can converse back and forth. So he's into the game like his dad is. Not, not fully like his dad is because um, I've even taken my Cubs towel and be waving it there, and my sons are all like this. Uh, when I'm waving my Cubs now, especially when the Cubs have the lead. And, uh, but uh, Travis and I, you know, we can talk baseball back and forth really well, and so Travis is into the game too. And uh, while the Cubs are winning, then, you know, three of the others are like, you know, they're down in their seats or they're finding something else to do until the Reds kind of get their act together, which uh, seems like the Reds have won uh, more times than the Cubs have when we go to, when the game we go to. And uh, so then, and then I've got uh, one of my other sons and he's mostly interested in, uh, well, we've eaten this, now I think I'll get me a bag of peanuts or I'll get some popcorn or whatever it might be. So he's interested in the eating. And then uh, and Chase is just happy being there with his uh, five older brothers. So each one of them, they have a different characteristic of the game and how it comes across to them. And so it, as it is in our lives that different things hit us differently and I guess I tell this all today for us to consider that there was 12 disciples. They were all picked or invited to follow Jesus early on in Jesus' ministry. So all 12 of them were with Jesus and, and seeing all the different events, right? They saw Jesus healing people. They saw him. They were all out in the boat. They saw him walking on the water. They saw him speak to the storm, and instantly the, the storm died down. They saw the blind healed. They saw the, and then they heard the, the teachings of Jesus. All 12 of them went through that together. 
And so my question here this morning is, why did Judas do it? He was with all the other 12 disciples. Now, all of them, you know, they all scattered, as we talked about last week with Peter, right? They all scattered and, and uh, maybe didn't deny Christ like Peter did three times, but they certainly weren't signing up to be right there standing by their leader and their friend. But Judas takes a different route here. And why did he do it? And, you know, I've heard, I've heard a, a number of messages on this, and maybe you have too, is why would Judas, and you, you think about it, we, they could all probably sense the tension between Jesus and the, the Jewish leaders or people that they sent to come and question Jesus and try and trap him. So they sensed that there was this opposition, one for the other. But then Judas, one of the twelve, goes to the Jewish leaders and says, I'm willing to help you. None of the others went that far to go to the opposition and say, I'm willing to work with you all on this. So why did you Judas do it? I've heard messages before that he was in it for the money, right? Uh, the 30 pieces of silver. We read in the scripture, though, that he didn't know he was going to be paid those 30 pieces of silver. He simply went to the uh, Jewish leaders to say that he would help them. And they responded, as Luke 22 tells us, that um, they would offer him 30 pieces of silver. And um, so, yes, there might have been some uh, greed. Uh, and along with that, uh, I've heard it said that Judas was the one who, and it's actually in the scripture, Judas was the one that kept the money bags, right? So he was maybe focused on the money. And for each of our lives, are there times when we uh, get pulled away by a money obstacle? Maybe it's trying to figure out how to pay for eight tickets to a Cubs game at Ripley Field, or whatever it might be that we feel like we need money for, or we'd like to have more money than what we have, and so sometimes we might compromise our beliefs or other reasons to uh, see how we can get some money. So that's one, that's one reason why uh, Judas might have done it. Um, another reason might have been, I asked Samantha this question, and she said, well, he might have done it for jealousy. You know, he saw the crowds following after Jesus, right? And uh, so Jesus is getting all the attention. We're just the hired hands. We're just the ones doing what Jesus told us we have to do. And we knew there was arguments, right, between Judas and the other disciples. All 12 of them argued together. Well, who's, who's the best one? So sometimes... That gets into our thinking, too, or, or even what might have drawn Judas to say, hey, I don't like it, the fact that I'm having to be, play second fiddle here, right? And so it might have been jealousy that Jesus is the one that everybody's following. Jesus is the one that's coming into Jerusalem and they're waving all the palm branches for him, Right? Uh, maybe another reason was kind of connected to Caiaphas and the Jewish leaders, uh, where we see fairly clearly that the Jewish leaders, they wanted to hold on to their power, right? And they, they were, they were uh, feeling the effects of this Jesus, and now he's come to the capital city, and as he's come here, people are following him. They're not, we're the Jewish leaders. They're supposed to be following us. But people are being drawn away. If we allow this to continue, we're not going to have any power left. And it's all going to be stripped away from us. Well, how does that factor into Judas? Well, Judas might have been comfortable with the way that 
sure was. They, he, he might have been comfortable to say, well, I kind of like that we've got these Jewish leaders the way they are because that's what I'm used to. And do we ever get drawn away to say, well, you know, I've heard the last, the seven last famous words of the church are, we've always done it that way. <laughs> right? So sometimes we're caught in tradition or our comfort of the way things are. We don't want to change anything. So really there's, there's quite a few things that could be pulling at Judas. You want to know what I think? Why did Judas do it? Yeah, I see some of your heads nodding. Here's what I think. I think that Judas was human, but so were all the other disciples. But that sometimes in our humanness, we get pulled in different directions. Now, whether we're a Christian or we have not come to that place of putting our trust fully in God, we still sense the pull. Just because we commit our life to Christ, like Danny did, doesn't mean everything just magically uh, falls into place and we don't ever have any more temptations, do we? No, I wish it was that simple. But what's the difference between Judas and maybe the other disciples? Yes, Judas could have been pulled by greed. He could have been pulled by jealousy. He could have been pulled by just trying to keep everything the same. And there's probably other reasons we could come up with too. But we get pulled by all these things. How do we overcome? We saw last week that Peter, right? He failed Jesus miserably. Even after he said, I'll die with you. But we don't see that Peter went out and killed himself after he failed Jesus. So what separates Peter from Judas? Judas even recognized his failure. After he'd taken 30 pieces, after he'd successfully pointed them to Jesus by the kiss. That's another thing that could pull Judas away, that, like it said in the reading, or it was the egg uh, reading from Patty, a pretender. Are we ever... Do we ever pretend to seem like things are a certain way? We'll even, let's see, when I go up there to point who it is, I'll act like I, I like him and that he's my buddy. So I'll give him a kiss. And what was Jesus' response to that? He responds back, friend as it was in the reading. So all these different things pull at us. But what was the difference that ultimately led to Judas' demise? Was it because it had been prophesied in the scripture from Zechariah and the Psalm 41? That it already been said, Judas, this is what you are going to do. There's nothing you can do about it. That doesn't sound very fair, does it? See, I think it gets back to the idea of some of what we lifted up last week. Jesus said to his twelve, who do you say that I am? And Peter, even though he stepped forward many times and put his foot, foot in his mouth, at that time he spoke up and he said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Peter.
Peter put his faith in Jesus. And just like we said last week, even though Peter failed in a very most critical time, God had a way to continue to use him. And yes, it had been prophesied in the scripture. But I believe that if Judas had chosen a different path, there would have been somebody else. That would have been one of the twelve. It didn't say Judas by name in the Old Testament scriptures. It just said 30 pieces of silver. Throwing those 30 pieces of silver back. It was a friend, a one that had dipped his hand in with the bread, with G with the with the Son of God. And I think it gets back to. You know, we're, we're all, as humans, we're all pulled in different directions. And Judas was pulled in different directions. And Peter was pulled in different directions. And all 12 of them. And the women, too, were pulled in different directions. But what carries us through? What is the anchor that holds? Even if we mess up. See, I think, I think Jesus, I think God invites each one of us and he asks each of us. Yes, will you follow me? But yes, will you offer your life to me? Will you turn over the reins to me? Will you allow me to be the Lord of your life. Not meaning that we'll always be perfect, we'll never make mistakes. But Jesus, you are the one that has the reins of my life. For I make that decision. Billy Graham was one. They even had it, it was called Decision Man Magazine, right? Do you make a decision? And Billy Graham would preach about this. We all have a decision to make. And at the time that we hear God's calling upon our hearts, do we make that decision like Peter did? To say, you are the son of the living God. That you are the one I put my trust in. In. And when we do that, God will carry us through all the ups and downs. Even if we betray Jesus with a kiss, he would carry us through. He'd help us through. Why did Judas do it? Because he never, he never fully trusted Jesus. Yes, he walked he walked along with all the other disciples. But he always had, and he probably felt at times, the struggle within him, was he willing to let go? Or was he going to hold on? Not just to the money bag, but hold on to his life and the way things work instead of instead of totally releasing it unto Jesus. It makes all the difference. And it's our decision. And the other thing I want you to think about as we close today is to think about maybe you've made your decision. But there's people that we're coming in contact with that is either, either a Peter or a Judas. And as we are alive in our faith, we can share God's love and how much he cares for them and that they could come to a place of trusting in him. So let us recognize that, realize that. Heaven and earth, are in the balance. Heaven and hell are in the balance. In this limited time we have on this earth. Not just for ourselves. But how might we share with somebody else. Jesus.
Jesus could not save Judas, but at least he could share with him. At least he could love him. At least he could call him friend. And he would call us to do nothing less. That we would carry Jesus with us and be ready to give an answer to the hope that lies within us. So that others might know there is a living God in the earth today. And you can come to a place of trusting him. Let us pray. Father God, this is not easy stuff, thinking of Caiaphas and Judas, and thinking of their decisions that ultimately failed. Judas ended his life with not receiving forgiveness, of not turning himself over, of not having a hope within him, of hanging himself and being an eternal damnation. Lord God, help us to know the importance, the eminence of these realities and that this is still so very true today, maybe even more so true today in the world in which we live and we can see people pulled in different directions, Lord God. And maybe we're the one, we're the one that you have placed in that person's life to make an eternal difference for them. Oh, Lord God. Help us to be praying daily for the lost. Help us to know for sure in our own heart and mind that we have yielded ourselves, holding nothing back, to follow you. And Lord, that we would be walking with you each day and knowing there is a difference between darkness and light. And though sometimes we get it mixed up, Lord, you're continuing to teach us so that we can burn brighter and brighter for you because you are the source that we are centered on. Lord, may it be so for each one of us that hears this message today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
knowing the sureness of our salvation, so that we might share it with others, knowing that some could be converted from a Judas to a Peter, Go in the love of Christ, which we are centered upon in these truths that the love of Christ is what motivates us to want to share truth with others. Let us go. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.